This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. All right, let's talk some charts. Nick, great to have you back here, buddy. So listen, on page two, we have that S&P 500 and obviously some uh, uh, significant whips on the last few days. Not a huge trend, but uh, definitely some whips up. But uh, now in this post-FOMC period, what levels are you looking at going into next week? I'm looking at the uh, 4,100 as resistance. We tested that twice in the last couple months. And then on the downside right now, 3,900 is my uh, support area. If we break that, I do expect a gap fill around uh, 3750 from a couple months back as well. Volatility is picking up a bit. So, you know, we should see some whipsaw action yesterday with FOMC. You know, we pushed up a little bit prior, came back down after the first announcement, pushed up again, and then came back down again. So, a lot of volatility yesterday. I was surprised that uh, the PPI data coming out on Friday when it came out higher than expected, that the market sold off initially and then closed almost flat. And then with the CPI, obviously, on Tuesday, we had a nice big gap up, and then we sold off most of that as well. So uh, a lot of volatility, but uh, key level I'm looking at right now is 3,900 for the support and resistance, obviously, 4,100 or so. Uh, Eric, what are your thoughts on the S&P right here? First of all, congratulations to Patrick for perfectly calling this last week. We got the pop up above 4,100 to, I think Patrick's words were surprise everyone last week. And uh, it only lasted for a few minutes in the wake of the CPI print, but it happened just about perfectly as Patrick called it. What happens next is what matters. So I'm watching closely. Uh, I don't have a strong directional view in the short term, although just looking at the tape, it seems like uh, maybe the post-FOMC uh, peak is in and we're headed back down to the downside. Well, we haven't seen below 100-day moving average. That was what held it last time. So if we get a close below the 100-day moving average, which is still quite a bit below the market as I'm recording, that would persuade me that perhaps the bear market is really on. At this point, I think it's a little bit too early to tell. Longer term, I'm still of the opinion that the bear market isn't over. You know, maybe there's going to be a, a Santa Claus rally through the end of the year. I don't know, but I don't think this is over. And I definitely don't think that we're headed toward a soft landing. I think we're headed into a major global recession. Well, thanks for the shout out, Eric, in terms of the levels. But, you know, to me, in order for this market to have uh, in any way be bullish, um, it really needed uh, something from the CPI and FOMC to kind of give a, a new momentum to the bulls to really start getting it to higher levels. Uh, at least these two things have now failed to be the catalyst, which uh, us going into a quieter uh, holiday period means that the markets uh, are going to um, end up losing a lot of the momentum they built in uh, through the month of November. And so uh, that uh, increases, in my mind, uh, the vulnerability of the market going into, into the new year. Uh, obviously, that 200-day moving average was one thing that we were watching. And the fact that we failed to, in any sustained way, hold above it, uh, this becomes a very interesting pivot going into the new year. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not so sure of my confidence level that something big happens in the last few weeks of this year. But uh, it, again, it, the more momentum we lose here, um, the increasing likelihood that January could have us uh, taking another trip back, at least down to the previous lows. And so the hedging strategies that, uh, Nick, we talked about uh, are uh, definitely going to continue to be a valuable um, tool to have in your um, toolbox. And I think we can spend uh, some time in the new year talking further about that topic. Topic. With that said, though, uh, on page three, we have uh, the NASDAQ. And uh, what, what levels are you watching for this, Nick? Yeah, Patrick. Looking at NASDAQ right now, I see on the Qs 300 as resistance. Uh, I thought we would gap fill that 310 area pretty fast after that nice little rally a couple weeks ago, but that didn't happen, obviously. And now support is heavy at 280, which we're almost at right now, 283 roughly. Um, there's a gap to fill at 263 from a, from a few months back as well. That one would probably be my target for the gap fill on the downside if we do break 280 
and today is not looking too good overall for the Bulls. Nick, listen, buddy. Uh, when uh, what I was observing uh, about the Nasdaq, particularly, is just how weak the price action has been relative to the S and P. Uh, and what we had was at least the S and P 500 in the last impulse was actually able to break to a higher high. Uh, instead, what we saw the Nasdaq attempt to even break those highs that it was uh, establishing throughout November and that uh, going into that first uh, few days of December and. And it simply gives it right back and it's just uh, such active distribution. Uh, and one of the things that's going to be really important for me to, to see is whether or not those lows on the NASDAQ that uh, in this case on the Qs around that 280, whether we give those out uh, next week, because uh, that would really demonstrate to me that uh, that the NASDAQ is uh, vulnerable for a breakdown and that could really drag everything down, particularly if it's a number of the these FANG stocks making lower lows, that's going to be the focal point. So I'm, that's uh, that certainly on my mind. But you know what, Nick, what I wanted to talk about was this VIX. And uh, what was really interesting to me here was obviously we had the spike in vol. And that was going into the CPI and into the FOMC. And it's interesting that while the market's been weakening, the VIX is completely backed off down uh, to the, the 21 handle. And what I find that interesting about that, at least from my perspective, is, is that uh, now that previous high near 25 is actually going to be important because if the market is going to go into any sustained new sell cycle, we should see a uh, sustained higher volatility volatility, particularly north of 25. And that becomes, therefore, sort of, to me anyway, a canary in the coal mine. Uh, will, will volatility start to trend higher from these levels or not? What's your thoughts on the VIX and wh- where it's going? Looking at the VIX, like as you said, right, that spike up to 26, I thought we'd get a continuation move to 30 or so on a further pullback. Uh, very surprising to see a pull right back. But you got to remember that this week is quad witching, right? So, uh, so Friday we have uh, expiration for four different main uh, assets, and right now support is around twenty again. So, I do expect us to pick up that VIX past this Friday. And if you're looking at the VIX uh, options as well, right now, yesterday the put to call volume was 0. 0.02, meaning that there's roughly you know, what is that uh, fifty contracts being bought per uh, on the call side per put being bought, right? So heavy, heavy call buying on the VIX, uh, which is obviously kind of bearish going forward. That being said, again, we expect about 1.25% moves per day on average with the VIX at these current levels. That's my thought right now on uh, on the VIX. Now, moving on to the US dollar on page five. Eric, has anything changed in your thinking here? Last week, I said the next major tell to watch for to confirm the dollar's downtrend would be a daily close below 104. Well, and this week, that's exactly what we got. So far, we've only traded a little bit below 104, so the possibility of a fake breakdown is still there. As I'm recording this on Thursday morning, we are back above 104, but only a little bit above it. Uh, But failing an exuberant rally well above 104, the trend is still down and looks to have farther to go. You know, Eric, when when, uh, I'm looking at that dollar, obviously uh, it's a prevailing downtrend. The price action continues to be weak, but uh, uh, increasingly... I'm uh, getting into the camp where I think that the extent of the dollar damage uh, in this pullback is mostly rearview mirror. And while certainly another dip uh, down below 104 can can happen here, I think that the next five point move or more in the dollar index is actually to the upside, not to the downside. And so uh, while uh, we haven't seen a decisive uh, shift in trend, uh, I'm uh, certainly going to be entering entertaining the idea of watching for reversal patterns and things that might indicate that we're going to have a counter trend dollar move. And uh, that's uh, certainly uh, that going to be my focal point going into next week. On page six, though, I wanted to just quickly comment on crude oil here. I know, Eric, you had that commentary uh, at the start of the show. But what I wanted to highlight here was uh, we obviously had a very ugly downtrend that uh, saw us hit that 70 handle on that January oil contract. 
And we finally got a bounce, a little bit of uh, tailwind from a China reopening story. But we're getting now to some very interesting levels around the $77, $78 level where we're trading. It's uh, where those September lows came in. And it's going to be a, a really important stress point moment. What we've seen with crude is every time these kind of three, four day rallies occur that are in the you know 5 to $8 range, uh, they uh, have always been faded. And the distribution almost immediately kicks in after these kind of bounces. And so this is a moment of truth here. Are we going to see crude oil resume this trend of uh, lower highs and lower lows and rolling over? Or will we finally see some signs that the bulls are back? Uh, and that to me would be a, a break of crude oil uh, north of this uh, $80 area and then not make lower lows. And that's uh, certainly going to be uh, what I'm going to be watching anyway on crude. Let's move on to gold on page seven. Eric, what are your thoughts here? Jim Bianco made an excellent point that the peak in treasury yields perfectly coincides with the start of this rally. So if this is mostly about yields, I guess that means how much farther gold has to run to the upside is probably a function of how much farther yields have to run to the downside. And that remains an open question. Meanwhile, gold is down sharply overnight. Uh, trading as low as $50 uh, in the Wednesday to Thursday overnight session, below its high that was put in just after the CPI data came out. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. You know, Eric, on gold, I've been uh, relatively bullish for the last couple of months, and I've been looking for some follow through. And even silver has actually been behaving better. But uh, the fact is, is gold's getting a little bit heavy here. And uh, I continue to view it as a, uh, a cross currency to the uh, to the US dollar. You know, Jim talked about that during the interview, and it really does echo my view. So really, uh, because generally, I think that the dollar has is so oversold and ready to go the other way. I have to be in the camp that uh, to, that gold at minimum on, uh, on the short to intermediate time frame has uh, room to uh, give some of those gains back. Now, uh, overall, on the big picture, I actually remain quite bullish gold, uh, but it, it just may not be the right time in the cycle for, for gold to start an epic new bull run. It might be later in 2023 where we see that. And so uh, while uh, it was a great run on the upside on gold here, uh, I'm uh, far more uh, short-term neutral, and I think that that's uh, the, the way that I'm going to be approaching it here. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. 
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.